Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Philip Cochran. I work for Scottish Book Trust, and it is my really great pleasure to welcome you all here today. Welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival for what I think is going to be a very exciting event. Um, I'm just having a quick look so that we can have a look at all of you and see what you like. <laughs> and it's always important. So, um, it is really exciting to be here today with these two great gentlemen to my right. Um, Genuinely, neither of them actually needs much of an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm stubborn that way. Um, so let's start with the man on my immediate right. This is, of course, the wonderful John Boeing, um, originally from Dublin. You'll tell by his accent. Um, John has written nine novels for adults and five for young people. He is probably, as Simon said to me earlier, at this point, best known for the boy in the striped pyjamas, but that could all change. Um, <laughs> which has sold more than 7 million copies worldwide, and as I'm sure you all know, has also been made into a film by Miramax. Um, we are here today uh, to talk about this book, The Boy at the Top of the Mountain, which is the third of the children's books that John has written um, tackling the subject of war, uh, the, th the other one being Stay Where You Are and Then Leave. Um, so this is a subject that John has returned to a number of times. On my far right, we have Simon Mayo. Um, again, as I am sure you all know, uh, Simon has been uh, with BBC Radio since 1982. Uh, he joined Radio 1 in 1986. He has, over the years, um, amongst many other things, uh, presented the, breakfast, uh, the Radio 1 breakfast show. Um, he presents Kermode and Mayo's film review on BBC Radio 5 Live and is currently uh, presenting Simon Mayo's Drive Time on BBC Radio 2. Simon has written previously three books for children, Itch, Itch Rocks, and Itch Craft, but today we're here to talk about his first YA novel, um, which is called Blame. Could you join with me in giving them both a really big welcome? Well, thank you. Now, we're going to do this today by having a bit of a chat up here, um, uh, a bit of a conversation, and then we are going to open up to the floor for questions. And we will be doing that reasonably sharply within the uh, hour that we have. So if you have a question to ask when we get to that point, please put your hands up so that we can see you. There is somebody with a roving mic who will come and um, talk to you. If you can uh, wait until the mic is there before you ask a question, just so that everyone else can hear. That's all the boring housekeeping stuff done. Um, I, except to say, I will also have my phone out. I am not being rude. I am just keeping a track of time. Gentlemen, let us start. So I wanted to start by asking you both um, very different novels, but uh, both jam-packed full of all sorts of detail and ideas and, and lots of people to read. Where did the, what was the original kernel of the novel? Where did the novel start? John, should we start with you? What kicked uh, it all off? Well, good morning, everybody, firstly. Um, it started uh, in a slightly unusual way for um, a YA book. In, um, as you mentioned, I write books uh, with an adult readership in mind and books with a, a young adult readership in mind. And I had an idea for a, a, an adult book, which was going to be set. Uh, in my mind, it was called Weekends at the Berghof. The Berghof of as many of you will know, being Hitler's mountaintop retreat during the war at the Oper Salzburg. And I was going to write a book where it was five, um, five sections um, in each year of the war and just follow uh, just one weekend each year and see what was happening there. Um, and I, I couldn't find the way into the story. I couldn't find what was going to be the, the connection. Mm. I didn't want it to just be Hitler-like. Mm. Um, uh, I thought about a maid or mm. something like that, but I just... I couldn't find it, so I sort of parked the idea for a while. And then uh, a couple of years later, uh, I uh, was thinking about what I was going to write next for young people. And this idea had stayed with me. And I just thought, well, there, that's how I could do it. You know, I mm. could bring a child into it. What if a child was, um, as it is in this book, the, the nephew of the housekeeper mm. and would slowly um, change over the course of time between 1939 and 1945? Um, so it started one way, and it, and it ended up being um, a, a book with uh, a, a central protagonist being a, a young person rather than yeah. an adult. And Simon, where did yours start? I had a rather bizarre <laughs> um, genesis, really. Um, I, 
because I've interviewed many, many authors, mm. hundreds of authors, of the, and John many times, and every time a treat. Um, I think that's right. Yes. <laughs> that's what I told him to say. Awkward. Uh, <laughs> I tend to spot kind of like made up stories. Mm. And if I was to tell myself this story, I would, sus I would think this is made up. Mm. I'm just telling you that it's not. So I uh, was uh, sent a letter by Michael Morpurgo, but probably Michael Morpurgo's editor, uh, <laughs> pretending to be Michael Morpurgo, <laughs> saying, we've got a book coming out to mark the anniversary of the start of mm. World War I. Do you have any story that you could contribute to mm. this? Was there any member of your family who was, who was involved? So I said my great uncle uh, died in 1916, and I don't really know anything about him, but maybe I could construct something. Mm. So they said, great. So I collected some thoughts and some words and did some research, found a photograph, and put it all together with a song. And uh, not, one of my, not a song, mm. but uh, <laughs> uh, a World War I song. Mm. Uh, and because it was... Because it was for Michael Morpurgo, slash Michael Morpurgo's editor, I thought, I'm going to do my very best work. Like, do your best work for teacher. Mm -hmm. So I really spent, it was like, it's just two pages, but I wanted to make it as good as I possibly could. So I sent it off. And then, uh, and that night, I had a, I had a dream. So uh, this is the bit where you go, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is now making it up. <laughs> And in the dream, I was queuing because I was going to prison. And I was in a queue going to prison because it had been discovered that my great uncle was a deserter. Uh, and everyone else in the queue uh, had similar stories to tell. And we weren't rebelling particularly. We just knew that this is what we had to do. So I, uh, I was just recounting the story. And my wife said, well, that sounds like it's the beginning of something. So it was just, and it was, that is really just a, it's just a seed. Um, and from there, the idea of heritage crime came from and uh, it, so, it sort of developed from there. And it was, it was always going to be a family. Originally, the parents were going to be to the fore. Uh, and then I was advised, wisely as it turns out, that the, the, the star of the book was probably the 16-year-old girl. So then, and who's the 16-year-old girl, and her brother, Matty, they, they come to the fore mm -hmm. and the parents kind of recede into the background. So then I, I guess the next question I had for you actually leads on quite nicely from that, which was about for both of you, you have these strong central characters who are young people, and did they arrive fully formed, or did they develop because of the needs of the story? Was was let's start with you, Simon. Was Matty a really clear voice? Sorry, was Ant a really mm. clear voice in your head from the start? Pretty, or? pretty much, yes. Uh, Ant mm. was always going to be well. Ant and Matty are biracial. Their their mother is Haitian, their father is white English. So they were always going to speak in a, in a patois. They were always going to look the way they look. Which, and Ant looks pretty fierce, so she has a mm. shaved head. They have, a reason, they have very different haircuts. Uh, Matty has lots of big hair and has virtually none, and there's a reason for that, which is explained in the book. Um, uh, she was always going to have goose tattoos. Mm. I don't know, it was just one of those things that didn't actually change very much. Mm. She was always going to be fierce and awkward and difficult mm -hmm. and loyal and, and wonderful. But uh, yes, pretty much Pretty there. much fully formed. But more in the, but more in the background. She, mm. But as, like I said, because it was going to be the parents who were going to tell the story, but then she emerged and so therefore she became the star. Mm. But yes, she was always going to be like that. And once you'd decided on the child being the focus that, mm. that hooked that story around, did Piero come to you fully formed or did he develop? I mean, he, de he developed in the writing, but the, the difference between him and characters I've written in my other um, YA books is mm -hmm. that in all the previous ones, the central character is generally somebody very good, mm -hmm. you know, really decent, kind-hearted, optimistic, positive, wouldn't let anybody down. Mm -hmm. um, and Piero starts off like that, but changes. Mm -hmm. And I'd never written about a, you know, a bad child mm -hmm. before, um, if, if that's how we can term him with the brainwashing that goes on. But it, it, and it was kind of interesting to me to, because there was a challenge of, I wanted to keep the reader on his side mm. um, and care about him, but he still does all these terrible things. And so it's, you've got to set it up at the start so that the reader thinks, okay, inside there's a good, there's a mm -hmm. good person, there's somebody who, who is uh, decent and can they find that again? Mm. So um, he wasn't fully formed, it was more, let me see how bad I can make him and still keep people and he's, and he's shockingly bad. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He's, he, he, gets, he gets pretty nasty. And, um, 
but you know, he's a Nazi, and <laughs> um, they're not renowned for their, their, their decency. Um, Actually, the real challenge is keeping you interested in, in any kind of redemption for him at all. And well, I mean, it's, it's a thing that interested me. I mean, the idea of, you know, when, when you think about something like the Second World War, and we think, you know, we, we could say, right, if, if we were 17 years old mm. or something in Germany in the late 30s, early 40s, we'd never do those things. We'd never be part mm. of it. But it's really easy to say that with the distance of time and mm. geography. Um, you know, we probably would have. It's, it's, and then I, I, you know, I really wondered about, well, what if, what if the war was over and you were 25? and all the stories about the concentration camps and the Holocaust come out, and all the things that happened in the 50s and Germany trying to um, get back on its feet and um, the guilt and so on. I mean, do, do you take it on board or do you, not, do you feel mm. like, look, I was just a kid, I was just a soldier, mm. and I was just doing what I was supposed to do? Or do you, does it overshadow your life forever? And it's, it's impossible to know without being in that position, but it's, it's an interesting moral conundrum, I think. It is, and I think, the, uh, Almost as a, a mirror reflection of that with Anne, your challenge with her is that she's the heroine of the story, um, and she's fighting, from a, a, certainly as I was reading it, from the reader's point of view, very much on the side of good and what needs to be uh, addressed and, and challenged. But you don't make her completely and straightforwardly likeable throughout the story. She's a difficult, difficult character. Yeah, she has every reason to be difficult. But yes, yes if she was walking... If she sat next to you on the bus, you might change seats. Mm. But that's. Um, <laughs> but I think that was. I think that was part of the thrill of of writing her. Really, mm. if you if you go through the process that she has, and uh, heritage criminals when they're locked up, they have a uh, they have a, a, a strap which is affixed to them, which is partly a tag and partly a punishment. Um, so they are. Uh, in a pretty horrendous state. So they're in, I've kind of reinvented the workhouse. That was sort of mm. the general idea. I was trying, having families locked up together, uh, a move which has proved very popular. Um, I did a piece, um, I did a, uh, attended a convention in London, which was the Young Adult Literary Convention, which Mallory Blackman has put together. And there was a theme of rebellion uh, in YA books. And I'd been put on that panel. And I said, well, the, the, the thing I, I, I want to say is that in my book, certainly to start with, there is a lack of rebellion, mm. that, the, that heritage crime is actually popular, that there's been a very bad recession and uh, the EU has collapsed. I mean, I wrote this a couple of years ago, but anyway, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so we need to keep it, an eye on any books he writes in the future. Yeah. <laughs> just to be honest, I did that just because it got us out of EU law at the time, <laughs> not thinking that actually we would be uh, in that sort of situation anyway. Um, mm. uh, and so I was sort of making that, but actually uh, the, the prison reforms that have been introduced are actually quite mm. popular. And so therefore the resistance in these books sort of comes very slowly, but mm. she is very much at the forefront mm. saying, this is, this is wrong, this shouldn't be happening, but there aren't a lot of people listening to mm. her, basically. But I think, you know, when you're writing about young people, young people are the same as old people in that, you know, they're not perfect all the time. Yeah. And you have to make them authentic characters. I mean. You've got kids, I've got nephews and nieces, and I brought my nephew to Australia with me over the summer for festivals, and there was at least 10 times where I wanted to pick him up and toss him into Sydney <laughs> Harbour. You know? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I mean, it, you, you have to give them edges of, of reality, of Absolutely. authenticity. Otherwise you don't care about them. No, they don't just don't seem real. They yeah. just seem like you know, paragons of virtue, and um, mm -hmm. it, there may be lots of paragons of virtue here, but... Um, <laughs> that there isn't. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> but also, the, uh, the situation that both of these characters find themselves in is, in very different ways, so horrendous, and, and su such a, um, there's such a roller coaster of emotion and experience going on for them. They, they need to be uh, strong enough to, to stand up to it, or in, in <laughs> Piero's case, it, it's about survival and, and, mm. and which way he goes. Um, he makes the best of where he finds himself to horrible, horrible ends. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, these are not books that blink. These are not books that look away. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of difficult stuff in these books. How do you make the decision about how far you push that in YA fiction? Is it something you're conscious of, or do you write it and see where you get to and then talk to your editor and your editor says, 
maybe just pull this one back a bit or I did I did have some of that um, mm. the the central bit in the book is is a prison riot mm. um, a couple of years ago on holiday I don't know what you read on holiday um, uh, people usually choose like a relatively easy option for, for holiday reading a couple of years ago I was reading a book called uh, the devil's butcher's shop which is an account of the worst prison riot in American history which is in New Mexico in 1982 and it just made me realize that if you're going to write a prison riot it has to be grim Mm. These are terrifying mm. ordeals. So uh, it, it's sort of part prison riot, part zombie attack. So that the um, the family prison is attacked from the one side by Pentonville, from the other side by Holloway. So the men come from one side and the women come from the other. Um, and the, so it's it's a sustained period mm. of uh, of peril. In a movie, it would have to get pared back because if you want to edit for a PG or for a 12, you know, it's sustained peril that is always the thing mm. that the censor, the, not the censor, but you know, that's what they're looking for. And so some of it was taken away because the because the riot is 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 a bad thing. You know, bad things happen to mm. bad people and to some good people. But the edit, my editor did say, it, this is this is t this is too grim, mm. um, and so you need you do need to pare that back. And I think if it was, uh, and that's specifically because you're writing for this audience. And I think if it had been for, a, but I think that's the only time that mm. I that actually I had to just oh right yeah pull okay. away just a little bit. Yeah, because there are at least a couple of other times where my, I know my heart was in my mouth. I was having a conversation with someone earlier where she said it's just your heart is here all yeah. the way through the, it. The bits that were taken out were, were where the prisoners take revenge on the prison guards. So mm. that was just the... And, you know, in retro, to be honest, OK, fine. Yeah. It didn't actually change the story, but it, it just meant we pulled back just a little. And what for you, John, what was the challenge there? Or I mean, a lot of it is instinctive, I think. Mm. You know, when I find myself in the voice of one of these characters, I feel... I feel I know mm. um, how far to go. The only point in it was um, because Piero ages from about um, seven or eight up to about 18 during mm. the story, um, there's a point when he's about 15 or 16 where he assaults a girl at a party, uh, a girl he uh, supposedly likes, but he assaults her. And I rewrote that chapter a lot of times, mm. seeing how far I was going to take it. And in one um, version of it, I was going to take it to its extreme. And, uh, and I think I pulled back because I thought, well, there's a point where he's going to lose all sympathy and mm. there's going to be no redemption. Um, and I thought, I'll bring him to a certain point and have, have her be the one who, towards the end of the book, mm. challenges him on his mm. behavior and where he will have no answer to it. He simply has to suck it up, you know, he just has to take it. And, um, but you know, there is a, it is a fine line, but, but I think it's just instinctive for authors. Mm -hmm. You both incorporate, um, for one way of be a better way of putting it, voices of conscience for your main characters in the book as well. Um, Matty acts as that for Ant and, and reminds her of things at, at very important points. Yeah. Um, was the, why did you feel that was needed? Was it important to you that that was the there? The, what, what that became was, I mean, my favourite books ever, probably, are the, uh, Philip Pullman's His Dark mm. Materials, just extraordinary works of um, genius, what an imagination that man has. And Ant and Matty are, are, are sort of, uh, I don't know if you, I imagine most of you will have read, but in one of the great ideas in His Dark Materials is that um, people have a demon, which is... Uh, where an animal, uh, up until puberty, an animal sort of reflects the kind of personality that you have, and the and the, your demon will change, and then when you get to puberty, your your demon is fixed. And 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 Ant and Matty are basically a matched pair. They when when they are apart, Ant gets into trouble, mm. and that's when she when bad things happen to her. Even if she's doing the right thing, that's when. Uh, she always ends up uh, in difficulties. When they are together, it's Matty who is her conscience and says, really, Sh are you sure? Mm. Um, and so that's really how, that's how they were always intended to be. So mm. he, Matty is her demon is really how I Im envisage it. It's a lovely relationship between the two of them and that, that dynamic that continues throughout the book. Whereas for you, John, it's, it's different voices trying to influence Piero as he goes through the book and, and, and becomes, well, more of a Nazi and more perceiving of himself as German and, and all of the stuff that that carries with it at, at, for those years in Germany. Hmm. Um, how important was it that you had those voices there? I'm thinking particularly of Emma 
um, when she stops the scene with Katerina. Yeah. Um, she's such a strong voice of resistance in her just because of how she is as a human well, being. You see, there's the so few characters in the book because mm. it all takes place at the top of a mountain mm. and there's only a few people living in that house um, and they all work for, for Hitler and for Eva. So um, I needed them to be somebody uh, that could reflect Piero's mm. actions and shine them back at him, that he would you know, start off as most young people would being respectful of their authority. Mm. And then at the point once he, you know, uniforms are very important in this book. That mm. Once he puts a uniform on, he changes. Uh, and he can speak down to the people working in the mm. house. And sometimes they'll answer back and sometimes they're frightened of him. Mm. You know, the older he gets and the more he shows this dark side to his personality, the more they are, um, the, the more they are cowed by him and, mm. and frightened of standing up to him. And, you know, there's something kind of awful about you know, a 50-year-old being frightened of a 15-year-old, mm -hmm. um, that level of bullying and intimidation and potential violence that um, Piero brings into the kitchen every time he walks mm -hmm. into it. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, I, I, needed, I needed just some characters that would, that would, would bounce that back off him. Particularly because... Because there's no other young people really no, there, so... No, not really. And, and also because you have this such dominant character of you know writing Hitler as a character in a book, interacting with individuals and having conversations that are influencing this young man in this book. Um, how how do you set about writing Hitler as as a character? Oh well, that was that wasn't too complicated because I thought the best way to write about Hitler is to to write him um, in a, as a sort of a pleasant avuncular figure in the house mm. because. If you just write the, the thing we see, like in documentaries and movies, mm. if he's screaming all the time, you know, this is a place of retreat. This is a mm. place of solitude and peace. Mm. And I've been to the top of that mountain, as maybe some of you have, to see the Berghof. And it, it wouldn't have made rational sense to me that he would be waking up in the morning mm. and looking out, you know, around the, mm. the Alps and, you know, breathing in the fresh air and, and you know, having some type of meltdown it just mm. um, and it's we, we know, we're so familiar with Hitler mm. that I think it's scarier to see him in a almost placid mm -hmm. you know but almost slightly at the edge that the slightest thing might just set him off we know what he's capable of in the way that Piero doesn't mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know it's like that thing in movies of you know turn the camera away and then you hear the screaming and it's scarier isn't it when you mm. when you don't see it um, and you just you're just conscious of it so I just thought, make him, make him like just this, this quiet, reasonably pleasant man who's living in this house. Um, but every reader who comes to it, you know, no matter how young they are, is aware of who he is. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought it would be more scary. Mm. Absolutely. And the edge that everyone else has around him is actually terrifying. Yeah, the tension, the yeah. tension there. Um, but it would just be very cliched to have him, you know, just roaring at everybody constantly. Yeah, definitely. Moving to your bad guy. I know where this is going. You do know where this is going. I do know where this as, is going. As a proud, proud uh, resident of Edinburgh for all of my life, yeah. I have a bone to pick with you. Yes. Um, uh, your bad guy is from Edinburgh. Yes. Um, why is that? Um, <laughs> I only remembered about an hour ago that <laughs> hate crimes. <Yes. laughs> Assessor Racist. Gray. That's right. Yes. What have you got again? Assessor Gray is. Um, is a fearsome um, beast. Though next to Hitler, mm. you know, <laughs> my protagonist is a pussycat. <laughs> um, the feeling I was trying to get was I wanted a fierce Puritan Calvinist. Uh, and it, it just came to mind as <laughs> Scotland does a lot of that, that kind of thing. Mm. And. <laughs> Uh, amongst others. <laughs> and Simon I, Mayo's last appearance <laughs> at the Edinburgh Festival. Yeah. My, my eldest on a reread said, Dad, this sounds like Michael Gove. And <laughs> there is, and actually, I went back to the description mm. of Assessor Gray when we meet him the first time, and it, and it kind of is. I mean, it started off, to be honest, a little bit of Mark Kermode. <laughs> that was the, but, but the glasses and the hair mm. and the stance and... I think Michael Gove's accent is Aberdeen, but anyway, mm. it was, there was just something about the Puritan, I wanted him, I wanted him to be a Puritan. Mm -hmm. um, 
and John Knox and people like that just came to mind and so I just made I apologize <laughs> I should have just made him from Aberdeen instead <laughs> and be done with it but that was that's that's why that's, his, that's why he is yeah so what can I say he is a terrifying zealot um, well the zealot was the other thing that kind of mm. uh, he's a passionate prison reformer not the kind of prison reformer that you'd like to uh, you'd like to have, but again, that sort of a uh, Michael. Go I mean, I'm not saying he was the thing, you know, Michael Gove is not like the assessor, but Michael Gove was a passionate prison reformer. He's had a hard year now. He's, he's had a hard. Yeah, uh, not as hard as the one the assessor gets in this book. But anyway, uh, yes. So um, the bad ca the bad guy is always fun to write, and he gets sort of progressively worse throughout um, the story. We see him in control and we see him on TV and we see him running the show. We see him getting promoted um, and we see him in full flow. Mm. And, and know, we do knows? passionately hate him by the end well, of the Well, you certainly do passionately hate him, mm. almost from the word go, actually. Mm. But yes, certainly, certainly, by, certainly by the end. <laughs> um, so we're about halfway through. Could we get a little bit of light up on the audience, please? Does anybody have a question they would like to ask at this stage? We will start, I have to say, your hand went straight up first. Could we get a microphone to the girl in pink top? What book do you feel is, like, not the most popular, but the one that you, if you were going to read, you'd enjoy most? Of their books? Yeah. Oh, it's always the most recent one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think of the, the, the young adult ones. Actually, the one I like the best is Stay Where You Are and Then Leave, the one that, that you mentioned set during the First World War. Um, I, I like that one the best of mine. Oof. God, it's I a mean, tough question. I mean, authors always say the most recent. I mean, unlike John, I've only written four, so I haven't really got many to, uh, to choose from. I guess the first and the last always stick in the mind the most because the experience of writing my first book was so weird and strange that I never thought I would ever do such a thing and I didn't tell anybody what I was doing although they were aware that I was writing like an idiot but um, I didn't explain what it was didn't know that. but I found the whole experience a very visceral one and, uh, and at times I was nervous about what I was writing you know genuinely my heart was racing and I thought I've never done this before this is quite fun so I would say the first one which was itch and then the, and the most recent one just because it's the most vivid um, in my head but I have only got four, so I've only just not mentioned two, and I quite like the other two as well. <laughs> <laughs> if you could save that question up for a few years' time and come back and ask it again... I'll come back. And the brilliant. answer will be the first one and the most recent <laughs> one. <laughs> um, you had your hand up as well. Quentin Jardin described that the, uh, the biggest battle that he had with his editor was over the... and the editor and the marketing department was over the title. How did you guys decide your title? Um, there was, there was, this one was absolutely very straightforward. It was always called Blame, right from the, very, from the first day, from that, where as soon as I thought of the queue, you know, remember the, remember the queue outside the prison, I, think, I like one word, I like straightforward titles, and it was always called Blame. There was never any uh, dispute about it, so it wasn't a battle. And, uh, and as far as marketing is concerned, I was when that came when that came through. I was so thrilled because it does it talk about vivid. Um, mm. In fact, my 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 youngest when he <laughs> it came out of the envelope. I don't know what it's like for you, John, because when you see a book for the first time, it's still a, a wonderful. Oh, thing. it's amazing. Here yeah. it is. It's, it's a never, physical thing. Never so seen. the first one came out of the envelope, and my son, who's sixteen, said, "Oh, Dad, orange is the new blame." <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> and I looked Clever. at him and I thought. <gasps> That's pretty good. <laughs> so so I, I passed it on to marketing at uh, Penguin Random House. And the expression on the faces was, in, in one expression, went, it meant, that's good. And also, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so, no, so, so marketing and editorial was very happy. Uh, I, I find with, with each book, sometimes, sometimes they come instantly. They're right there at the start. Um, Boy in the Striped Pajamas was right there from mm. like chapter four. Uh, and sometimes you struggle and you can't find one. Um, I, I had one previous title for this. And um, there's a moment in the book where Piero's aunt um, is describing Hitler as the darkness at the center of the world. 
And I, my, when I submitted the book, I called it The Darkness at the Center of the World. And my editor was like, big grim. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> can, can we just lighten it up a little bit? Nice try, um, John. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then I, I just thought, well, you know, I, I came up with this one instead. And I thought, thematically, um, it, it links with the boy in striped pajamas. And um, it seemed right. You know, it seemed part of. Uh, maybe something more to come on Second World mm. War. There's a part of me, because my Dutch publisher has, called all, has changed the titles of some of my um, young people's books, and they've called them all The Boy Something. Mm. And like Noah Barley Water Runs Away, it was called The Boy Who Ran Away. Um, and I kind of, I, I always wish if I could go back in time, I wish I'd done that. <laughs> you know, I wish I'd called them all The Boy Something. Um, and then at some point in my life, I would write one called The Girl Something, <laughs> just to really, you know, just to shock people. Mix it up. Um, but it was the second title, so it's not the darkness at the center of the world. Which I still think it was good, but it is, it is That's, That is grim. That is a better title. I suppose, mm. yeah, yeah. I think people are more inclined just to pick that up in a browsing mood than The Darkness at the Centre of yeah, the World, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Sort of just, ideal yeah. summer holiday read. For yeah, yeah. It, um, could, it could go along with The Devil's Butcher Shop. Yeah, that sounded, <laughs> that sounded wonderful. You, you've got your cheery summer reading here, yeah. folks. Um, there is a, a hand up right at the back. Sorry, we're going to make you run. I apologise. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is a sort of gender one, in a way. So we've been to several events this week with... Uh, YA um, male authors, several of whom have mentioned that in editing and in publishing it's something like 90% female. Um, I wonder how you two have experienced that because several of these male authors have commented that they feel sometimes that the female energies are making them pull back a bit in their work and perhaps there is a kind of I don't know, repressed male voice within uh, YA publishing. Who would like John to tackle Boyne that is, one? Uh, <laughs> tackle that one. Um, well, they're certainly right that uh, I think publishing is one of the few industries in the world which is dominated by women. And the, um, the major publishing houses tend to be their, their CEOs or whatever the, the correct title is, um, is you know, mostly women, actually. Um, so, you know, women are very well represented in that. My experience over almost 20 years of it is that um, in publicity, for example, it's almost all women. It's, it's 19, I, I think if, if I met a male publicist, it would be a real surprise because it's always um, women who seem to be there. You get more guys going into editorial for some reason. Um, and I, 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 don't know, I don't know why that is. It, it, I hesitate to say it, but it, it makes me wonder, is it because the editor is often seen as the more boss-like of the, it's, it, the person in charge who, you know, for right mm. or wrong, I mean, that's, mm. you know, the editor buys the book, the editor chooses what's being published. Um, I don't know really about, I, I don't know much about female energies and how they are expressed. Are you a repressed male voice? Um, <laughs> Um, I don't know. I'm, I feel I've got about 20 things going through my head right now, that, but I feel if I say any of them, it's going to be misinterpreted and I'm going to be hounded out for saying something politically incorrect. Um, you, you know, I mean, I, I, I've, I've always worked, to, I've worked with a woman editor on all my YA books. I work with a man editor on my, my adult books. I don't see any difference, to be honest. They're both passionate about books, passionate about getting the best mm. story out there passionate about getting the best out of me, challenging me as much as possible. Um, and I, I don't think I notice any particular mm. gender split. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm, an, I'm a novice here, really. Uh, I don't think there's any repressed male voice. It certainly is true, as John says, that it is overwhelmingly female. I, one of the first things, first bit of promotion I did for the Itch Books is I, I addressed a librarian's conference uh, in Windsor and it was, I think, 100% female. Mm. And, I, and I was thinking, I've never spoken to an audience which was 100% female. And it was fantastic. And I don't think any, there's any section of publishing that would improve necessarily from having more men in it. But um, I've had a male editor, I've had, two, I've had a female editor, and I, I have no idea why, why there's it. Maybe it's seen as a caring profession. I don't know. What it, why I think it's be? just time we gave men more opportunities in the workplace. <laughs> <laughs> uh. We're an oppressed, yeah. oppressed yeah. minority. 
I am praying nobody takes that out of context. Um, <laughs> I think it's worth noting, noting as well as we go through that YA fiction and children's fiction, um, women writers are very well represented as well. Perhaps not, it's not as much of a balance as it might be within the adult writing world. Um, but certainly, it, it, it's always struck me as being quite gender balanced within well, who's yeah, producing the writing. There, there is a difficulty though, because mm. and, and I often teach classes to to, mm. to young writers on creative writing courses, and it's a, there's a real difficulty if you're if you're say 25 years old, 28 mm. years old or something, and you've written your first book and it's terrific, and you're um, a young guy or you're mm. a young girl, you've, there's two very different yeah. paths that can happen. Yeah. You know, a young guy is automatically going to be taken seriously. Mm. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. Well, I mean, it's wrong, but I'm just saying <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not proponing it. It's, mm. it's a young guy is taken seriously by the media, by the newspapers, um, will be reviewed mm. um, by um, either gender mm. in the papers. A, a, young, a young female writer, um, literary editors almost never get men to review women mm -hmm. writers. Um, they will get women to review mm -hmm. them. And any young female writer who I've known over the years, particularly if she's good looking, the publishers will often try to push her into a certain type of jacket, mm -hmm. um, a certain type of you know woman looking towards the distance, blowing a forget me not. Um, <laughs> and if you're a young, well, it's just true. It happens. Yeah. And if you are a young female writer, as many people probably are here, you really have to work mm -hmm. against that. You have to push against that and not allow yourself to be um, to be so uh, gender stereotyped. Um, it's 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 tougher out there for uh, female writers, young female writers, than it is for the young, good-looking male writers. Uh, I would wholeheartedly agree with no, that. No, it, it is, yeah. and it's something like it's, it's I mean, I know, I know of a couple of female writers who, younger female writers, who have succumbed to the pressure mm. and whose writing career has not worked as it might have done because actually they're not being published or being allowed to write the way that they want to write, which is with the same amount of seriousness as a as a Kutsia or a mm. you know an Ian McEwan, mm. um, and um, it's something. If I was an editor, you know, it'd be something I would be thinking about a lot. Thank you. That was a really interesting question. Thank you very much. Um, I wasn't expecting the event to go in that direction today, I must admit, but it, it was, it's, it's interesting to hear people's opinions. We have another question down here, uh, lady in second row of stripy top. Sorry, I will just identify you by clothing, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, I apologise, I've not actually read either of these books Next. that you've written. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously now I will. Um, but, um, and I've not read any of the young adult fiction either, but I'm quite interested having now that you've written these books, and John, I know that other books of yours have dealt with this similar subject, um, have you come to any conclusions about you know future generations and how they deal with um, you know what previous generations have done? I mean, mm -hmm. as an Australian, um, especially with an Aboriginal niece, it's something to me that's a very big thing because we've obviously got the stolen generation and there's a lot of pressure. Um, and it's been a huge part of how our country has developed. So I'm just wondering if you have kind of come to any conclusions about how future generations deal with um, what the previous generations done. Sorry, could you? I just missed the end. Future generations deal with what the previous generations done, I and the you know basically the accountability. I, I guess I, not any kind of really wise um, answer to it because. Every time I've explored that, it's, it's written in a very contemporaneous way. It's only like in this, there's a closing chapter where he's a few years older, um, but it's you know, eight or nine pages where he has to confront it. Um, it's, it is something I've thought about actually, thought about, um, I, I've often thought about, if, if you've read The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, I've often thought about Bruno's older sister who survives the story, um, that you know, she'd be an elderly lady now. And I've often thought about that, you know, well, what, what would that be like? What would it be like to be that person? Um, and maybe that's something I would, I would write about at some point, but um, I, I don't actually have a, I don't have a really considered answer to that one, sorry. Simon, have you thought, have you come to any conclusions? Because that's pretty much what you're writing about. Yeah, I mean, coming to, yeah, I mean that coming to conclusions is, is a, an overly grand way of mm. coming up with any of my thought processes at all. <laughs> In as much as I thought about it, um, the idea of heritage crime which on the one hand is lunacy, but the, the whole point 
was to try and make it popular and believable. Because if you didn't go along with the idea of heritage crime, then the whole book won't, won't work. So I spend a lot of time with um, some politicians trying to construct a way whereby someone would go on question time, defend it, and get a round of applause. Because you know there's always some lunatic that's sitting here that says rubbish and then gets a huge round of applause and it drives you mad. Mm. Well, it's that kind of, you know, and there is a certain logic to the someone has to pay. Someone has lived very nicely, thank you, while well, we've had a very tough time and I want to see you pay. And um, I had a long conversation with Charlie Faulkner, who was the chief um, lawyer under Tony Blair and worked with Gordon Brown and he's a very eminent legal man. And he said, <clears throat> there's lots of places in America in American states where they are moving towards the idea of this kind of heritage perspective anyway, which is it's sort of answering your question a little bit. So, for example, if your grandparents ran an asbestos factory, um, which is now long gone, so your grandparents, and it's got nothing to do with you, my grandparents grew up around that asbestos factory and suffered terribly. They're all gone and I'm fine. I can sue your estate because look at you, look at all that wealth you've got which you shouldn't have, and look at the poverty that my family is in, which they shouldn't have. I have some claim on your wealth. Now, there's a certain logic that is being run through there, and if you add in some kind of penal retribution into, into the thing, then maybe if you can't pay, then you should go to prison. And I'm answering your question by selling there's my race book. race reparations <laughs> as well. <laughs> yes, Slavery exactly. Reparations. And, and Charlie Faulkner, he made, he made that, exactly that point. He said there'd be some people who would say that slavery is a heritage crime and that if a bank or a corporation did very well out of slavery, even though it was hundreds of years ago, maybe they still owe a debt to the, to the families who, who suffer now. And so all of a sudden he flipped it in that one sentence thinking, oh, right, okay, then there is something here um, which isn't really answering your question, but it's just sort of unpacking some of the, the thoughts and processes that we went through. It's one of those questions, I think, that I don't really think there is one simple answer, so I wasn't really mm. okay. Have we any other questions from the audience? And there's a young lad there. Uh, yeah. My question's for John. It's, what, it's about why he likes writing from a Nazi point of view, because a lot of authors would write from a view, the view from like a British point of view. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I, I want to find a story that isn't told most of the time. And uh, I think, you know, we read a lot of books which are um, told from the point of view of the, say, in striped pajamas, from the Jewish perspective, or the Jewish character, and, and I'm not Jewish, I don't have that experience. Um, from the British characters, I'm not British. Um, I don't have that experience. I didn't have any family members who went through any of those times. And I'm kind of interested in the darker side of things, in the, the evil that happens, and why people would do those things. Whether it's an adult, whether it's a teenager like Lieutenant Cockler in, in striped pajamas, whether it's a child like Piero in Boy at the Top of the Mountain, what would make somebody behave in such a terrible way? I guess it's kind of asking, Am I capable of it? You know, are you capable of it? Is anybody? Um, and trying to trying to trying to convince myself that I'm not. Maybe you know. Um, so uh, I I just I, I when I look at the Nazis, when I the reason I keep coming back to this in my work, both on the adult side and the children's side, is you know it's it's not that long ago. It's in my parents' time, and you look at a country where everybody just decided to just follow one person and listen to hatred and bigotry and, um, I mean, God, we see it now, don't we, in, in America, what's happening. And, but you think, how could that happen? If you, read, if you read about it like it happened in the 15th century, you figure, well, it's mm -hmm. the olden days. This isn't the olden days. Um, this is my parents' time. So I guess that's why I keep coming back to writing it from the inside the head of the evil character. I did think... Um that there is a glimmer of hope offered across these two books. Because we've talked, we've talked about some quite grim stuff today. But I, I was quite interested that you chose Germany, Simon, as the, the country that was standing against the idea of heritage crime, specifically because of the lessons learned yeah. from their history. Which is, yes, that's right, which is a sort of a time with John's uh, area of work here. Mm. Um, so heritage crime has happened in, in a whole bunch of countries. Uh, uh, and they've all taken it on board. The country that stands out, as you say, is Germany. 
who because of their heritage have decided that we're actually we've done this whole blame thing and we, we don't want to do it. And so Germany becomes the place where people want to escape to and German becomes the language of freedom. And so the resistance groups, which are only just sort of beginning, or bug groups as they're referred to in the book, they, they start adopting German phrases and German uh, words as a way of identifying themselves. Just because I thought it would be a fun way or an interesting way of um, developing a, a lexicon that's, mm. that's different. Uh, which, when mixed with the Haitian words which Aunt and Matty have and the prison slang, meant that I had to put um, a glossary of terms at the beginning <laughs> of the book just so you can understand some of the conversation. There's a, there's a thing across both of the books about language and identity and, and having language that you only share with a few people, the, uh, Anshul and the, the sign language mm -hmm. for Piero and obviously the, the uh, Haitian language uh, for Aunt and Matty. Um, was that a conscious thing, or was I mean, you've, you've explained the mechanism of why yeah. it had to happen. But I mean, the the it, it started because we have some friends who are foster parents, and they are white, and they had fostered a, a black family, and I was just watching them going around and imagining what that would be like, and the conversations that they would have, and how people react to them, and, uh, uh, and so so that was the very beginning. But the the reason from the story point of view is that um, Aunt and Matty's father is abusive and so they, and he's white English. So they, divert, they speak in this Haitian patois as a, as a defense mechanism so they have a private conversation against him. Then when they're in prison, it's a private conversation against everybody else, uh, which is quite useful if you mm. can speak in a code. Mm. Um, so it really kind of, you know, it came from there. And how about for you, John, John the, um, the choice to have the sign language between Piero and his friend Anshel, w w where did that come from? Um, yeah, at the start of the book, Piero's friend, best friend Anshel is, is deaf. Um, it came from an event just like this. Um, I think it was at the Hay Festival, and a little girl stood up, and uh, it was literally the week I was, about, I was starting this. Mm. And she had read my previous um, YA books, and she asked me why I never had a character in any of my, any of my books with a disability. Mm. And I had no good answer for her, you know, mm. and I thought, I don't know. And I just thought, well, why not? You know, I mean, yeah. why not? And I thought it would be interesting to, to bring in a character to use sign language mm. um, in writing to see, mm -hmm. and to not make a big fuss about it. Mm -hmm. You know, that Piero and Anshul have been born basically around the same week. Um, they've always communicated mm. through their hands. And just m not make a fuss of it in mm. the story, just let it be. And it's as normal as anything else. And um, so it just literally came from that little girl. Great. Yeah. You heard it here first, folks. If you've got any really good questions that might help in that way, now is the time. Have we got more questions in the audience? Gentleman in a check shirt. And there's a lady down there. Yes, I will come back to you if that's. Am I allowed to be cheeky and ask a question to each? Yes, of course. Others? Simon, um, you first. The a few years ago, I. Uh, started um, trying to put a small book together, a bedtime storybook for my kids, um, thinking that it would be um, something easily achievable before Christmas, and this was probably late October. It wasn't until a few weeks later that I found out how difficult it was to manage full-time employment and life in general, and try and put something very small together. You obviously have a very busy life, you've got a full-time job, and I was just wondering how you uh, are able to organize your time to meet deadlines and um, get books out when you've got such a busy life? Uh um, uh, yeah, I can answer, answer that pretty succinctly. I mean, it, it, um, the original idea, I mean, I w I'm, the, I'm the most surprised person, uh, apart from my mother, that I'm actually here <laughs> writing books because, you know, I didn't start till quite late. So, um, with all honesty, uh, playing records is a part-time job. So. Um, uh, when I moved from Five Live to, to, to Radio 2, I had a, a few hours spare. So when the idea took hold to write the, write the first itch story, and I did become sort of possessed by the idea, I kind of wrote in the morning and then I went in and did the afternoon uh, work and did the radio and did the radio then. Since then it's become slightly more difficult, but it means basically writing on holiday, it means writing uh, at the weekends. I interviewed Jacqueline Wilson uh, a number of years ago. She said, I write on Christmas Day, Simon. Mm. And 
last Christmas, so did I. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was up first, and I thought, if Jacqueline Wilson can do it, I'm going to do it. So I wrote a paragraph. <laughs> it was rubbish, but you know, I, you know, I wrote it. But basically, essentially, it's, it is tough to crowbar things in, and that's why it's quite a long gap from one book to the other, um, because I am not prolific, and this has been three years in the making. And it was quite a complex book, but it, it just takes a long time. So that's basically it. And your question for John. Yeah, yes. and, and for John. Um, uh, the Boy in the Stripe uh, Pyjamas, uh, which we've kind of touched upon, uh, is, um, I was just interesting to know, when you first started with the seed of that, that book, did you intend it to be a young adult book, an adult's book? Or did it progress from one thing to another as the story came? And did you have any idea how influential that story would ultimately become? Uh, I was about three chapters in when, in, into the first draft when um, the thought occurred to me that because the central character was um, an eight-year-old boy that this is probably a book for young people. And as quickly as it occurred to me, I dismissed it as irrelevant. It didn't seem important. I just continued on writing the book. And, but when I presented it to my agent for the first time, I did write on the front of it, um, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, uh, a children's book. Um, and in all my life up till then, all the years of wanting to be a writer, trying to be a writer, and then being a writer, I had never once thought about writing for young people, ever. Never crossed my mind. Um, and, um, but I presented it as such. I think the thing that surprised me was that it, um, it found an adult audience as well, which was wonderful. Um, the, the truth is these, these terms, um, in some ways, are very modern terms. I've mm. said this before to audiences, mm. that they're publishing terms and bookshop terms and media terms. And we don't always have to think as writers in those terms. You know, a story is a story. What's Treasure Island? Who's that for? Mm. You know, what's Narnia? Who's that for? What's David Copperfield? Who's that for? You know, it's, um, I mean, I, I know I, I buy into it in the sense that I specifically say a book for adults, a book for young people. Well, actually, I've stopped saying that. I say a book about adults and a mm. book about young people. And I think that um, is, a, is a big difference. Thank you. There was a lady in the front row, if we could... In the white T-shirt. Hi, my question's for John. Um, and it was really... The boy with the striped pyjamas moved me in ways I can't even describe. And having seen the film and the stage play, I just wondered how involved you were in both and were you happy with the end result of both of them? Well, I'm happy to tell you there's a ballet coming. <laughs> um, wow. No, it's, that's not a joke. I don't know why you're laughing. Um, <laughs> Could you uh, sort of there, maybe there just yes. do a couple of scenes first? Uh, I, yes, you can clear away the table. No, Northern <laughs> Ballet are actually doing a ballet in, um, in, in the spring, and there's an opera coming in, wow. in <laughs> Australia. So I don't know what's going to be next. It's, um, <laughs> was I, I, I was with both. I was. Um, I, 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 I worked on the film. I didn't work on the play. Um, but uh, I thought the film was... Um, a really strong adaptation. I think adaptations of books, they, they don't need to be slavish to the original source. They, you know, they should respect it, but you have to translate it in some way. Um, the, the joy of being an, a novelist and something like that happening is that if they make a really good movie, then everybody says, well, it was a great book. And if they make a really terrible movie, they say, well, the book was a lot better. <laughs> so you, it, it's kind of a win-win situation. But I, I thought in both cases, movie and play, they respected the not just the source material, but the subject matter, and the, the themes I was writing about, the, the real life experiences I was writing about. And, and for me, did an excellent job. Great. We have time for one more reasonably quick question. There's uh, uh, another check shirt, a redder check shirt. Sorry, items of clothing again. <laughs> um, hey, just touching on what John touched on a minute ago about YA fiction, adult fiction stuff. Um, I mean, personally, I really kind of dislike that sort of stuff, but I don't know, how do you think that impacts on readers? Because you talked a little bit about how, as a writer, you kind of work with or around that, but how do both of you think it affects readers something is labeled adult, young adult, children's, versus just being able to read what you want? <laughs> well, of course, one of the problems is that, you know, there are some, as we all know, there are some magnificent writers of book f books for young adults and some magnificent books written, but they're kept in a section of the shop that maybe your mum or your dad might not walk towards 
you know, they, they'll stay in the adult fiction section. Um, I remember about, was it two years ago or something, I remember Kevin Brooks' book, The Bunker Diary, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, I read, I probably read about 100 novels a year, and that was absolutely my number one book mm. of the year. I thought it was the best one. But I wouldn't have come to it, really, if it hadn't won the Carnegie mm -hmm. and been brought more to attention. So, I mean, adults aren't necessarily going to walk down to the YA section. They're missing out on a lot. In the same way, you know, there's a lot of books in the general adult section that, you know, 14, 15 year olds um, could, I, 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 at 14 I was reading, I got into John Irving, mm -hmm. um, got into Margaret Atwood, um, Anne Tyler, mm -hmm. people like that, Colin Tabin. Um, it's, it's, it's just up to people themselves to decide where in the bookshop to shop, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, it's there, to, it kind of helps and it doesn't, you know. I mean, if you want to buy a book for, if you want to go into a bookshop and you want to buy a book for a five-year-old and you, you don't know really, it does kind of help if it says this is for three to six-year-olds or pre, so sometimes it helps, but it, it, it then becomes enormously frustrating if what you're writing about is, um, I mean, there wouldn't be a single adult who would pick up John's book or any of John's bo books about young people uh, and, it, and not think it's for them. I mean, it's just, but, so it's a completely artificial construct, but I just understand why it exists. Because if you don't know, if you want to buy a book for a nephew and you don't know much about the kind of thing that 14 year olds are reading, then I can understand why a bookshop is constructed in, uh, in that way. But there are, I mean, I mentioned Philip Pullman earlier. I mean, his Dark Materials has to be the most complicated, dense, philosophical trilogy uh, that I've read. You know, most uh, grown-ups go, I'm not quite, can we talk about dust? I'm not quite sure what that's about. You know, so <laughs> goodness knows what 12-year-olds are making of it. You know, I don't know. So hopefully it's a, a useful way in, and then you can explode the boundary once I think you... The, the, the idea of rejacketing books for a YA market and an adult market is is an interesting thing that creates division maybe that doesn't necessarily need to be there always, but also means that books find markets and, and people to read them that they wouldn't otherwise find. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. Um, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of our time together. Um, John and Simon will both be signing after this event in the book signing tent next door. I would ask if you would very kindly give us a couple of minutes to unplug ourselves from microphones, because otherwise we get told off. Um, and, and then we will come and, and the signing will commence. I hope you have all really enjoyed this event as much as I have. It's been a real pleasure. All that remains is to ask you to join with me in giving them a really big thank you.